we have those chants before the meditation every evening as a way of establishing some perspective on what we're doing. Because otherwise we carry our normal narratives from the day right up into the meditation. And they can have a lot of force, making it very hard for the mind to settle down and be in the present moment. Sometimes it's simply doing a tally of the day, and sometimes it's a tally that goes further back. And so it's good to get a larger perspective. Sometimes your stories have to do with either unskillful things you did to somebody else or unskillful things that other people did to you. And not to deny the harm that was done, but you have to be able to get past that kind of narrative. Otherwise it's very hard to settle down. This is why we have those reflections. Like the one, all living beings are the owners of their actions, heir to their actions, born of their actions, related through their actions, and live dependent on their actions, or have their actions as their arbitrator. There's another translation. Try to think of that as covering the whole universe and going way back in time. And you realize that the stories of our lives have no real beginning. And unless we find awakening, they'll have no real end. It's just kind of a back and forth sloshing around. Because if you trace back why someone mistreated you, well, maybe sometime in the past you mistreated somebody else. Or why did you mistreat somebody back then? Well, there's some karmic explanation that, that goes way back, goes back and forth, back and forth. And as the Buddha said, you can't really trace a beginning point. There's no point where you can say, okay, this was the first person to do wrong. Because a lot of times it's, well, he did wrong, therefore I did something in response, but I was justified in doing that because he was the first to do it. Well, who knows who was the first? and try to open your mind to the immensity of all that. And the purpose of this is to dissolve away all the significance we give to those events, and to realize that without this path to the end of suffering there is no closure at all. It's just going to keep on going on and on and on, causing ourselves suffering, causing other people suffering, other people making us miserable. You want to develop a sense of dispassion to the whole thing, a sense of sanguega, the sort of dismay over the pointlessness of the whole thing. There really is only one thing that has a real point, and that's learning how to stop creating suffering and how to get out of the whole back and forth. When you can think in those terms, it's a lot easier to settle down. Because every time the mind starts to leave the breath again, you run into that same big, immense body of pointlessness. We're here we have a point. There's a purpose. We're trying to train the mind, realizing that the only way out of that whole mass of suffering is to understand why we're creating it. What's the ignorance, as the Buddha said, that gives rise to the craving that makes us forget that a lot of our actions are causing suffering and we focus on other things and have other agendas and start creating other narratives? But the real issue is, why are you making yourself suffer? Because when you make yourself suffer, it's very easy to spread out and start making other people suffer. And when you make yourself suffer, the other actions of people, the ac <coughs> excuse me, the actions of other people can give you grist for your mill for making yourself suffer. 
So here's the way out. Try to bring the mind to the present moment. And put aside the issues of who you are, what your personal past is, what your personal narrative is. If you have any narratives at all, think of it as a narrative. It says that after all that suffering, you find that we're able to learn how to bring an end to it. That's a good narrative. That's the narrative that brings you into the present moment. So we use the mind as an anchor to stay here. When you're with the breath, you know you're in the present, because you can't watch any past breaths and you can't watch any future breaths. Just the ones right here. This one right here, right now. And if you're going to stay here, you want to make the breath comfortable. That involves experimenting with the way you're breathing and also experimenting with the way you're thinking about the breath. Think of the breath as energy flow. It's not the air you're squeezing out through the nose and pulling into the nose. It's an energy flow that can flow through the body in all directions, come in and out through every pore. Think for a minute, every pore all around you. When you breathe in, it should be coming in from every direction. When the energy comes in, does it feel like there's a conflict? Are there a lot of eddies and whirlpools, or is it more coordinated? If you find any places where there seems to be a discomfort, patterns of tension, tightness, blockage, just think of them dissolving away. Think of every part of the body, every cell in the body being nourished by the breath energy. This is called singleness of preoccupation. You try to fill your body with one perception, perception of energy, breath energy coming in, going out. And by enlarging your sense of awareness of the body, it makes it easier to stay in the present moment. If you're just on one little spot, it's very easy to get knocked off. But if your frame of reference covers the whole body, then you can hear sounds and they just go right through the range of your awareness. But they don't have to knock you off, off balance because you've got a large foundation here. Thoughts can come through. and. As long as they don't make you lose your larger frame of reference, they're not going to do any damage. You can just go passing right through. You don't have to get involved with them. You don't have to find out what they're about or identify them, what kind of thought it is. And above all, you don't want to try to tie up the loose ends. One of the main lessons of the practice is that there are lots of loose ends in the world that can never get tied up. So you just learn how to accept that. And a good way to learn how to leave a few loose ends around. And this is not a question of being irresponsible, but simply realizing that there are a lot of things that can just never reach closure. So a good way of getting some hands-on practice with that is allowing your thoughts to remain untied up, not neatly folded up and tucked away. A thought comes through, and you may have a vague idea of what it's about, we'll leave it vague. Or if it's a story that seems to be going someplace, well, just leave it unfinished. The work you do want to get finished is learning how to get the mind here in the present moment. That's the issue that really counts. So try to stay in the present moment with a sense of spaciousness, but also having a sense of being grounded. This is one of the issues you'll have to learn how to bring into balance. Sometimes when the body feels heavy, you want to develop a sense of lightness with the energy that's coming in and going out. Other times when the mind feels scattered or wired, you need to give it some grounding. So learn how to bring things into balance so it feels 
right being here. It feels just right being right here. Now the breath energy feels generally good. You may want to go through the body section by section to investigate how is it going in specific parts of the body. Are there little places where you can straighten it out even more or allow it to straighten itself out even more? Just give it some steady attention and see what that does for the breathing there. You might start at the navel, come up the front of the torso, up through the head, then down the back. Out to the legs, out to the tips of the toes, then focusing on the back of the neck, go down through the shoulders, out to the tips of the fingers. Get really acquainted with the body right here. Because it's right here that you're going to learn how to see the movements of the mind clearly, if you maintain this frame of reference. If you get knocked off, you'll see a little bits and pieces of the story, but it won't be complete. And then you make up your own connections in the stories, which may or may not be true, but the fact that you've made them up leaves them still questionable. If you really want to see what's going on, you have to be here continually. You start seeing cause and effect, and this is important because it's certain things going on in the mind are the ones that are causing the suffering, but there are other conditions you can develop in the mind that can put an end to the suffering. And you want to see those connections and learn how to replace the first kind of cause with the second kind of cause, the good ones. But if you don't look at things continually, it's just a story that you've made up for yourself or that you've heard from somebody else. You actually want to see things in real time. It means you've got to stay here continually, not let yourself wander off. So do what you can to make the present moment interesting to yourself in terms of the energy in the body. If you have any frequent illnesses or recurring illnesses, this is a good way to learn how to use the energy in the body to help heal those problems, or at least make them easier to bear. That's one motivation you can bring that can help make this more interesting. If you know you have a habit of dredging up thoughts that make you miserable. This is a good place to stay in order to watch that happen, to see, well, what is it you seem to be getting out of bringing those things back? Why is the mind feeding on those things? Here's something a lot better to feed on. So regardless of the thought that comes up, you want to see it as an event in the present moment. In the beginning, you don't want to get too involved. In fact, the less involved you are with your thoughts, the better. I mean, it's inevitable that things will come up, but you have to learn how to deal with them quickly. So whatever the thought comes up, if it's a painful thought, just goodwill for everybody involved, yourself, the other people. And we all find a way out of that unskillful behavior, and then get back to the breath. Because whether they're going to find the way out or not, that's basically up to them to train their minds. But the only way you're going to find a way out is to keep coming back and training your mind. So it's in this way that we can start to dissolve a lot of those old narratives, and to dissolve our fascination and our interest in feeding on them. We give ourselves something better, but we also give ourselves a larger framework. There's that story of the woman who had lost her child, and she was grieving for the child in the cemetery. The child's name was Jiva, or Life. And the Buddha saw her and said, Do you realize that you've buried 84,000 children all named Jiva in this cemetery? Which one are you grieving for? 
And it's strange, grieving, realizing that you've lost 84,000 children is a lot easier to bear than realizing you've just lost one. It's a larger context. It's the immense context that helps to dissolve the, the narrative away. That's a temporary solution. The permanent solution is when you learn how to dissolve things away through really understanding what the mind is doing in the present moment and training it so that it overcomes the ignorance that keeps us going back to the narratives and creating new ones all the time. So the solvent is right here, the mindfulness, the alertness, the ardency you bring to being with this breath energy in the body right here, right now. So give this your full attention. <laughs>